And welcome, folks, to the sixth episode of Behind the Brand. Thank you all so much for being with us. My name is Anna Hendricks, and I'm the CEO of Arts Digital Agency, a full-service social media marketing agency specializing in the health and wellness industries. You can find out more about us at artsdigitalagency.com. In addition to managing an agency, one of my greatest loves in life is the personal story. From growing up watching actors' studios to my love of memoirs, biographies, and nonfiction books, the personal journey has become an obsession. I am so inspired by the stories of normal people who did something extraordinary. But what fascinates me most isn't the pinnacle, but the climb. On B2B, we get to know people who have managed to take a typical life and turn it into a spectacular one. We'll be discussing the trials and successes, the quirks that make them who they are, and how they continue to grow as individuals. Today, we'll be discussing dealing with ADHD and becoming successful as an entrepreneur with Brian Fanzo. But first, I want to introduce my co-host and community manager, the fabulous KP Kelly, who is a branding consultant and a Twitter marketing specialist at Arch. Thank you so much for all you do. Your yoga thing here, KP. <laughs> Brian, you're going to be doing a little bit of yoga tonight. <laughs> the only it's yoga I know is through. Your Snapchats, so we're good. <laughs> that one yoga move we can do, that's it. This is all we need. So I'm pleased to introduce my fifth guest in this series, Mr. Brian Fanzo, AKA I Social Fans. Brian is the leading voice of the millennial nation in digital media. He has 10 plus years experience managing, deploying, and training enterprises and small businesses on cybersecurity community management, collaboration, digital marketing, video conferencing, and social business. As a technology and social media specialist, Brian has been a keynote speaker since 2005 at numerous technology conferences, as well as quarterly presentations for the federal government joint chiefs of staff, such a mouthful, and on-site in Iraq and Afghanistan for the United States Army. His passion for change and people is evident as he delivers keynotes on topics ranging from employee advocacy and live streaming to personal branding. He was recently awarded the top 25 social business leaders of 2014 by IBM and the Economist Intelligence Unit has been and has been nominated for the first ever Shorty Awards Periscoper of the Year. Thank you so much for being here, Brian. My pleasure. I feel like I don't I'm glad I don't have to read my own intro because I would really screw it up. So I need to, I need to shorten that thing because I, <laughs> I, I, I screw up my own intro. But uh, no, thank you. I think the point is, uh, I'd say it's uh, a whole lot of stuff that leads to a whole lot of change, I guess, is the uh, is the underlying principle. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to actually, you know, it's like turning Twitter friends into like we've been like Twitter friends, Snapchat friends. And now we are we are blabbing it up. So next next thing is you know hugs and selfies offline. So we'll do that next. Hugs and selfies, hugs and selfies. Yeah, no doubt. I was just kind of like swimming through that. Like, okay, lots of big words, lots of big words. <laughs> Trying not to mess it up. It's all good though. All right, folks. Before we jump into the show, as always, we are going to do our segment. I have decided to change it from Anna asks to the audience asks. Um, it just makes a lot more sense to me it, because the questions come from you. It seems like that makes more sense. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's true. I never thought of that before. It was more like on an answer. <laughs> yeah. It's just kind of annoyed me. So anyway, this is a segment where you as the audience submit a random question and there is one minute for all of us to answer it. So I'm going to get my timer ready. And if we don't have any questions, then I will, Ask the one that I set aside. Do, do, do. Brian, she That's really it. does cut That's us off one. in a minute, too. <laughs> All right. <sighs> I, ran, I ran overtime just being asked what my favorite color was. <laughs> <laughs> KP is yeah. long-winded. <laughs> well, I, my tagline is, you know, talk fast, tweet faster, but it doesn't mean that I get less in. It just means I talk a lot about a lot more in a short amount of time, you know, in the same amount of time. Fonda doesn't mess around. No, I do not. <laughs> okay, we've got a great question here from Jessica Malnick. Hopefully I didn't massacre your last name. Ryan, you're first. If you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? One minute. Go for it. Pretty easy in my opinion. I say tele teleportation. I want to be able to teleport. I don't want to be on an airplane. I don't want to, you know, if I want to be somewhere, if I want to hang out in San Francisco, I want the superpower to let me ha make that happen. So that's mine. 
All right, fair. That's it. <laughs> That's all I got. I mean, like, it's funny because, like, for me, it jumped right to my. I'm one of those people. That as soon as it comes to to life, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop that exactly what it, what comes yeah, to the first, yeah. first out of my mind. <laughs> Good job. All right, you got a lot to live up to there. Uh, yeah, I, well, I was. My first thought was uh, the ability to fly. But wait, wait, wait. I haven't stopped. Start. Okay, uh, one minute. My first thing was to say flying, but I don't really like heights. So that wouldn't really make any sense. It especially wouldn't make sense because I would choose flying so that I could quickly get from one point to the other. But Brian said I can teletransport anywhere. So now that I've thought that he's brought up that superpower, I want that superpower because then I could just go anywhere I want anytime. That would make a lot more sense than flying. So that is my final answer. As okay. long as I get to wear a okay. cape though, while I do it, because I, I don't want to have a superpower and not get to wear a really cool cape. I'm really in a for the cape. Really? Isn't the cape like a guarantee? I mean, you can't have a superpower without a cape, can you? That's like impossible. No, I, yeah, I don't think you can. All right, 12 seconds. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good, KP. Okay, one minute for me. Flying would definitely be my superpower. It's always been the one I wanted. Teleportation's fun, but I I love the world, man. I would just love to be up in the clouds, be up in the mountains, be up in the trees, be up with the birds. Like, oh, I'd love to fly. That would just be incredible. I'd be jumping off buildings and going all sorts of places. And I mean, I think teleportation would be fantastic, no doubt, be a lot quicker, but I'm so obsessed with nature that, yeah, I'd be like on Everest, I'd be in Iceland, I'd be, I'd be all over the place, so. That's mine. All right, let's go ahead and let's grab one more. One more over here from Mr. Andy Parker. Doo, doo, doo. Wait, where did it go? Oops. These questions always drive me nuts. <laughs> okay, there it is. All right, one more from Andy Parker. What was your favorite? Favorite comic strip when you were a child? Go ahead, Brian. Wow. So I'm, I was, so this is like the weird uh, truth of I wasn't in really into comics. I was a baseball card collector. Um, and so the weird thing that comes to my mind is actually Garfield, um, mainly because oh, nice. I loved the lazy cat idea of like, you know, you just get to really eat lasagna and have uh, everybody else wait on you. So I think Garfield is my random uh, favorite comic strip. Okay. I love the uh, orange cats. They've always got so much personality. All right, KP, one minute. What was your favorite comic strip when you were a child? Um, Ziggy is up there mostly because like Brian, I was into like sports and stuff. So I would skim through and Ziggy was not really a comic strip. Usually it was just one, one little thing. So that, <laughs> it didn't take a lot of time there done. But Marmaduke because it was probably Marmaduke for a comic strip because I had a dog growing up who was a yellow lab golden retriever mix, but he was freakishly large for that. He was five, five six when he stood up and 146 pounds. So he was massive. So almost all the comic strips that seemed like outrageous things that could never happen, our dog actually did those things. So um, I liked Marmaduke. Marmaduke. Okay. 12 seconds again. Nailing it, same time every time. Uh, okay, my favorite comic strip. You know what? Uh, I, I didn't read comics. I don't even know that I really saw any. I think like Garfield might be one. Um, so you picked this question, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it was the first one that came in. I want it to be fair. <laughs> um, Who picked this? Oh, I didn't answer it. Uh, yeah, no, it was, it would have been Garfield would be the only comic strip that I would have seen. Where's, so where's the audience? That. I, I want to hear, I want to see the comic. What is everybody else's? What are yours? They're just agreeing with us, but you got to have some different ones out there, audience. Anna, I picture you as somebody that would like, would have drawn your own comic strips. No, no, no. I was like climbing trees and like Trying getting to dirty and riding bikes and like. Play, I, know I, was like actually, I was like collecting baseball cards too and football cards and just being a tomboy overall. 
Oh yeah, Calvin Hobbs. That's one I thought someone would have said. I, I would assume you know yoga, a vegan yoga comic strip if that existed. Oh, no, I thought you would have. I'm not a vegan corner. anymore, Brian. I know. I, know. Doc- I just keep. Up. Doctor said no. <laughs> but how about new? No. Uh, all right, folks. Well, let's go ahead and jump into this show. Again, I just want to thank you, Brian, for coming on and being here to talk about ADHD with us. Brian and I kind of, uh, we connected on this subject over Snapchat actually last year. Brian was at the doctor and he was getting his medication. And I'm like, dude, I have ADHD too. And uh, we kind of, at that point in time, we're we're just like, we should jump in a blab and talk about it at some point because... You know, more professionals, A, they're embarrassed by it. B, they don't understand, you know, who has it. C, they don't maybe understand how to overcome it or how to deal with it. Um, They don't see the positives in it as well. They're just kind of focusing on the negatives. And so I'm really, really excited to talk about being an entrepreneur, just being a person in general with ADHD and kind of go over, you know, Brian's life, how he's learned to to live with ADHD, all the really cool things that it's done in his life. So I think uh, the the best place to start always with any ADHD story is school, right? <laughs> when we were kids. So talk to me a little bit about what you were like as you know as a kid. Were you quiet? Were you hyper? Were you well, you know, I, and I love that we're talking about this because I think you brought it up a little bit. Not only, you know, I kind of actually that Snapchat opened my eyes, that Snapchat you were referring to, because the amount of people that out that reached out and said, thank you for talking about that. And I, I broached the subject without much hesitation. To me, it's, it's had just a positive impact on my life. And when people were saying that, I kind of like, I, it almost made me want to like scream it from every rooftop saying like, hold on a second. I didn't know this was, and then the more I talked about it, the more I researched, um, you know, and it's interesting because so, for me, just to set the stage, I wasn't diagnosed and, and uh, put on uh, prescription or anything until I was 31 and I'm 34 now. Um, so I, you know, high school, I like to say I loved high school and college, all of it except for the class part. So everything about school, except for actually going in and getting the work done that I was supposed to get, you know, I had, I had like perfect attendance um, and through most of high school, but yet, you know, struggled to get through with, uh, to get into college, mainly because I love the people I loved. I, I, I've always felt that if it's something that I love doing, so if I had computer classes or I had, you know, a shop class or I was really big in the journalism at the time, like if I was in journalism class, I would love those classes. I would spend extra time. I would do all the homework. But the rest of it, you know, I I took four years of Spanish and never passed Spanish two, um, <laughs> which is definitely not something to brag about. But like looking back, like I mean, I struggled reading books that I wanted to read, but it, I never looked at it as, as like, and, and you know, from my family and my parents were just like, hey, you have to you have to find a way to do things the way you like to do it. And you know, I never was, I never knew it was an excuse, which is probably a good thing for me because I just assumed, hey. I talk a lot. It's hard for me to focus and pay attention because I like people. That's that's my challenge. I need to overcome that in the classroom. And so I, you know, I would take notes and study extra hard, but still not do great grades. And I mean, reading books was a struggle, a real struggle. I mean, I can remember my 10th grade English teacher telling me that like when she knew I was in her class and you know, I, I kind of make an impression the year before and, and I'm not shy. So I slightly stand out. And she was like, she went out of her way to pick out a class a class book that she thought for sure, catch her in the rye, I can still remember, that I, that she thought I would like. And she was like so excited about it. And I ended up buying the Cliff Notes at some point and ended up you know doing it that way and then admitting it to her. I mean, and I remember her like being heartbroken, but it was one that I couldn't really um, dive into. So high school to me was, um, I loved high school. I absolutely loved it. I just really struggled to get through classes and, and, and really, you know, focus and pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> when you and I had talked about this before, both like, yeah, so school. <laughs> yeah, it's like, wait a second. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's, it's a really difficult thing. I know for me in high school, I basically refused to go to class. Um, and, and sitting in class was really tough. But when I loved something, like I never missed English. And like you, I never missed journalism. Like I love journalism. I was willing to to work hard, you know, for the the classes that I loved and I wanted to be a part of. Um, we had a good question here from from Chocolate Johnny. 
Uh, what was it like being Brian Fanzo as a little boy? So a little bit before school. So I was born in Pittsburgh. And if you know Pittsburgh, I mean, the reason it seems like Pittsburgh sports teams are everywhere is because people live and breathe. And it's really the only thing to do there. Um, and then we realized we don't want to live there the rest of our lives, especially at the time when I was there. So I was born in Pittsburgh, um, the oldest of two brothers. Um, my dad owned a candy company um, that made peanut brittle. And we moved um, just before middle school to Virginia Beach. And so I really grew up middle school and high school in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Um, and, you know, I guess the, the little Brian Fanzo side was I played every sport that imagined. There was no sport that um, I didn't play. The ones that I sucked at and the ones I was good at, I was competitive as hell and hated losing. So for me, losing was um, I wasn't I wouldn't say I was a bad sport, but, um, you know, I, I played everything from golf to soccer. Um, really, my my love was baseball. Um, and then I had three knee surgeries. And my love pivoted to hockey, which I ended up playing hockey through four years of college. But for me, I was the uh, my mom always says, you know, I was the one that lit up the room and everybody knew I was there. But I was also the loudest and probably the most difficult child. I'm an extremely picky eater. I was even more of a picky eater growing up. So um, my mom said, eat two spoonsfuls of green beans or you're not leaving the table till bedtime. I sat there until bedtime. Um, and I was <laughs> I, I was literally I, I can remember like out. And, and my parents weren't very strict. I was very lucky. My, my dad's my my hero and I'm a mama's boy. So I, I was very lucky in that sense. But, uh, you know, I went I, I surfed and, and went uh, in the ocean pretty much most of the days uh, through my last couple of years of high school. Uh, my family owned a frozen yogurt shop, surprisingly enough. Um, and my dad actually bought the yogurt shop with the intention of getting to know all of his son's friends. So it never turned a profit. It was actually a, it was not a, uh, not a wise business decision, but um, I, I started managing it at 15. I, I um, had a fire, a friend um, before I was 16 years old, who was, uh, you know, outside of uh, traditional of what you were supposed to be doing, working at a yogurt shop. But um, it taught me so many things. The idea of managing people above me, understanding how freaking hard it was. You know, I remember saying it was probably like 10th grade. I was like, I want to own a sports bar. That's what I want to do. I want to be a sports bar owner. I want to own a restaurant. Well, after like two years of like semi, you know, having part time manager duties of a frozen yogurt shop that was only open in the summer and really only had like four ingredients, um, I realized quickly how hard that dream was. And it wasn't as easy as putting sports on a TV and throwing a hamburger on a menu. Um, so, you know, I was I was that, that was kind of me growing up. It was great. I, I love being the older brother. So I teased the hell out of my my two younger brothers. But we were extremely close um, living in Arizona. I actually bought the house directly next door to him in Arizona um, next to my brother. So, um, yeah, I guess that's the answer to my backside. You know, I, I'm so, I, you know, I have, I'm very lucky because I had the, you know, work hard, blue collar mentality of Pittsburgh. But I grew up in Virginia Beach, which is very transient for military. And I got to surf and, and listen to country music and drive a Jeep Wrangler. So I have um, my one of my I think my favorite traits that I never realized it until recently was um, I, I did theater in high school. I was on the baseball team and I was a computer focused guy. So if you put that in my life, I was friends with everyone and none of my friends really crossed over until they met me. And so I was the one of one of many niches and I kind of bridged all those niches together. And that's kind of uh, I, I think it's helped me become the generalist that I am today. Right. Well, I think that honestly, anyone, like, especially people with ADHD, we have so many interests because um, our interests are varied anyway. And our mind is constantly jumping. I don't think I've met anyone with ADHD who doesn't have a very varied lifestyle, like varied social, varied interests, varied, you know what I mean? It's kind of like picking up a whole bunch of different toys and running off with them. Someone asked uh, Miss Sandra here, the inspirational expert, did you ever do social for your family biz? That's a great <laughs> I, don't... So I didn't because by the time I was really into social was later, but my dad um, for like my frozen yogurt, actually I'll, I'll have to grab one of the cups. My dad was huge on branding and he always said, you know, he was going to, everything that we always did was like our name. So it was Fanzo's Itch Yogurt was the name of the yogurt shop. And like we had t-shirts that had like, you know, surfboard logos on it. Um, we, I still have uh, drinking cups that have the logos on it. So my dad was huge, even for the, the peanut brittle company that he had, uh, he had these butter toffee peanuts and he made like a little logo for it. And my dad never really told me that what he was doing was marketing. What he always said, it was he wanted to make sure people remembered the product and the experience that they gave because he believed 
in the experience being great, but they had to be memorable, especially, you know, a yogurt shop was people came in the summer, went back to their houses in, you know, Pittsburgh or, or, or and then came back that next summer. We wanted them to remember and come back to us. So I would say early on, I didn't know my dad was a master of marketing and branding um, until recently. But yeah, that, I didn't do any social for him, but I, I definitely got to watch the master of really, you know, making, I mean, we, people bought t-shirts, like hundreds of t-shirts a summer were sold with my last name on it for a frozen yogurt shop, just because of what my, you know, kind of like how my dad understood what the customer would think. So no, no social in the family biz though. I feel like we have so much in common. A, I think our mothers should talk because they would be like, <laughs> oh, exactly. Thank you. My wild child. And then B, like I grew up, you know, in a family restaurant and branding was such a huge part of everything within the family. We sold t-shirts. It was a Mexican restaurant called Mi Casa and everyone in town wore those shirts. I mean, they were huge. Um, I love knowing this about you. So you started off early getting into branding and those sorts of things. Um, what do you think was like, you know, growing up, because you've kind of touched on a, a couple of different businesses, I feel like that your parents, you know, that you kind of grew up in, like, how did that kind of prepare you for the workforce? Um, well, the crazy part for me is like my, so my dad owned a, a peanut brittle company or he was a part owner of a peanut brittle company called Old Dominion Peanut. And it was in Norfolk, Virginia, and he was very successful. It was global. Um, it was growing to the point where he had to turn down business because he didn't want to um, take the, the business overseas. It was a family owned company before um, he became kind of came in there. And um, growing up in high school, uh, everyone assumed my brothers and I would just go into the family business um, because it was successful, because we were, you know, we were, uh, I was very lucky. You know, I was never, I would say I was never spoiled, but I never uh, had to feel like I had to um, worry about where my next, excuse me, where my next meal was coming. So my dad had like a very um, strong suit, but through high school, my dad instilled something in us, my brothers and I from day one. And it was like, um, the, the only way you can ever stand out is you're going to be yourself. And the only way you're going to be successful is you're going to chart your own path. And m never once did he say, I want you to come to the family business. He said, the door is open, but I want you three to decide what you want to do. And I chased, um, I actually wanted to be a guidance counselor um, before I kind of realized <laughs> what guidance counselors got paid in a salary perspective. <laughs> um, and I, I kind of switched a little bit to computer science, but my brother, my middle brother was an architect um, and my youngest brother is a mobile AV um, specialist. So he does, you know, audio apps and in the mobile space. So none of the three of us went into the family business, but we, we kind of knew that it was an option, but my dad never, you know, not only would never have made it a path there, but he grew up, um, his dad, his dad, I worked at a concrete company. My dad didn't go to college. Uh, he owned a kind of candy broker side, um, this serial entrepreneur, you know, ever, I mean, I don't remember a job that he had. He, he might've got a senior VP job when we moved to Virginia beach, but it wasn't long before he was part owner of the company. But I also kind of knew that my grandfather worked for Westinghouse his entire life. It was his first job when he turned 18 and it was his last job when he retired, you know, in his late sixties. So I think for me, the, the entrepreneur bug was really the idea of going after what I want to do. And if that meant going and working in big business, which I did, I worked for the Department of Defense. I mean, I uh, worked for a 25,000 uh, employee company. I worked for UPS directly after college. Um, that My dad never really thought of that as less. It was just always making sure that um, I focused on what I wanted to do. And I think that's, I mean, my success has a lot to do with that because I think if I had to figure out a way to put myself in a box, um, unfortunately I probably would have never went to college and I would still be, you know, in Virginia beach, probably surfing every day and, and not doing much at all. Cause, um, the idea that I knew that if I could be myself, like that, that would be enough for me to focus on. That was kind of my, my driving force, um, through high school and college. Cause I, I did really struggle to get through high school and college. So you, I know that ADHD is like a hereditary disorder. Both of my parents have ADHD. It's a lot of it was a lot of fun growing up in my household. Um, what what about your parents? Do you, do you know if either one of them have it or uh, neither, neither one of them have it from a you know um, a diagnosed uh, perspective? And I see Sanders that you know I'm I am an Italian Irish family, so my my grandfather <laughs> and my, on my dad's side is uh, the Italian. That's where the uh, Fanzo side. Um, but you know, like my mom. Uh, my mom remembers, you know, being, you know, I don't remember how old she said I was, but she remembers the stigma that when it was associated in the early or the late 80s, early 90s, that if you were, you know, diagnosing your kid with ADHD, that some people would look at that as you being a bad parent. 
And um, I can tell you, um, my mom gave me every opportunity in the world to succeed and fail, but I knew she was always there for me. And I, I did plenty of my, my failures <laughs> throughout my, uh, my, my growing up. So I, you know, for me, I don't think my parents, either one of them, I know for a fact they hadn't been diagnosed, but my youngest brother was actually, actually, that's kind of how I um, found out that for me, it was something I needed to look at. And my younger brother, my youngest brother, who's like very much like me, got diagnosed and was telling me how much it changed his work habits and his focus and his drive. For, and and it was during his college years that he got diagnosed. And it, I started questioning it. And I was like, I wonder how that works. Um, and so I guess for me, the interesting part is I'm not sure where, um, in the family side, um, my dad is one of those people that will, if you ask him to do something, he says, yes, he will do it no matter what. He is a man of his word, a man of his handshake, sometimes to my own frustration. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I would, it'd be interesting. I can tell you my six-year-old daughter now already has the traits of the, uh, you know, squirrel and running around with a uh, little abandon and loves life. But sometimes I'm not even sure what, what she's loving at the moment. She just loves life. <laughs> You gotta let her just go, right? Yep. That is especially. So you said that, like, you know, kind of what led you to looking into getting diagnosed was your younger brother was saying how it changed his life and helped him do better. What was it about your life that was difficult or complicated or maybe rough that you felt like, okay, maybe I need to get this checked out too and see, you know, if these areas are things that that can be attributed to something. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because I would say, and I'm, I'm probably not, um, you know, that's why I love, you know, Anna, you and I, when we were talking the other day, you know, your, your understanding of the diagnosis and the disease and, and, the, and the kind of the background goes far, much farther than mine. But I can tell you, when my brother started telling me things that the doctor was asking him, you know, my mom would always joke that if I sat in front of the TV and found something good to watch, she could scream my name for the other room. And I wouldn't be able to, I would act like I didn't hear it, right? Because I was so zoned <laughs> in to whatever the heck I was watching. Um, you know, and then I've always been, you know, I had, I had severe acid reflux flux from um, right after my junior, senior year of uh, high school. And it caused me to get sick to my stomach. I threw up almost daily for a couple of years. And I went through lots of treatments, no red meat for six months, no alcohol for six months, no caffeine for six months. Um, and every time they would say, good news is um, it wasn't that. And I would say, that's never good news. Um, I want you to actually fix this. But along that way, the idea of um, I never was one that slept much. I never felt like I needed to sleep much, but I just never slept much. I, I slept a very low amount of hours every day. Um, and that's concerned a lot of people around me and, and with the acid reflux thing. And so my, when my brother told me, you know, the attention, the fact that he could read a book, the fact he felt motivated and that he felt rejuvenated when he woke up. Um, I didn't go to the doctor actually saying, hey, I want to be diagnosed with, you know, Adderall or I think I have ADHD. I just told him, hey, my little brother got diagnosed and some of his symptoms crossed over to what I was thinking. And I never brought those symptoms up. I mean, my poor doctor at the time, you know, he was like, what? You've sleep four hours a day. And you're, and I was like, yeah, I was like, you never really, you asked me if I was well rested. I said, yes. Cause I've been well, <laughs> like, you know, like so for me, the, you know, it was one of those things that a, a light bulb kind of went off. Um, as soon as I started talking to him and he just, I mean, he, he must've asked me like nine questions and he said he planned on asking 30 and on the ninth question, he's like, okay, I already know. <laughs> He's like, now we're going to figure out what this is and, and, and how it's going to work. And I will tell you, I am, was growing you know, through my 20s. I hated medicine. I refused to medicate. I wouldn't take Advil for hangovers. Like I was just I, I just didn't like the idea that, uh, you know, I, I, you know, alcohol was enough of my stimulant whenever I wanted to drink and, and, and hang out and party in school and stuff. But um, so that was one for me that was going to be a worry. Because the idea of, you know, Adderall, for those that aren't on it, you know, for me, the the highs and lows and the fact you have to be consistent on it. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, my alarm on my iPhone has been the same alarm since day one. It goes off twice a day for me to take my medicine uh, because I would forget to take medicine. So, yeah, um, no doubt. Yeah. So that, that's kind of how it all kind of um, it came to me. And my doctor was very hesitant on um, giving me Adderall at the gate, you know, and, and went through a lot, you know, I went to the, the psyche vow, we did a lot of things. And he was like, you know, you're already fiery as hell. You're already active as hell. I'm not going to be able to stop you. He's like, you know, I want you to, you know, and I drink energy drinks, right? So I was very transparent about that. He was like, I'm not going to tell you to change your diet or, or uh, change any of those things. But I just want you to know every three months, you're going to get an EKG. And I'm going to do an EKG on you every three months. And we're going to make sure and knock on wood to this day, 
I have not had one fluctuation in my EKG since that that first time. So everyone that always worries about me for my my monster drinks or my my lack of sleep. For me, that was a little bit of um, reassurance, the fact that he was willing to take that, because then I was a little bit more confident and say, hey, I'm going to do what he said and see if it really you know, helps me, because I felt like he was, he was doing a good job of kind of um, you know, giving me a little bit of more security on you know, some, of the, some of the risks side. Yeah. So twofold. Uh, one, I wanted to know if you had any, you know, if they had tried any other medications before you jumped out to Adderall. I almost said alcohol. <laughs> um, and then we had a good question come in from Tom Markham earlier about your experience with Adderall thus far. So, um, yeah. No. So, um, so out of the gate, they, you know, he gave me, um, I can't, he, it was two different kinds of, um, you know, he wanted me to try two, two different things for 30 days each. And I can't remember them off the top of my head. I even went back to look to see if they were, um, but I don't think, I think they were some kind of version of, um, Adderall, it was either like a, a name brand or a non-name brand. It was a uh, delayed release versus um, non-delayed release. Uh, but what I think he was really um, trying to figure out was where it impacted my sleep and how long, you know, taking it. And I can tell you, I don't sleep any more hours now than when I started doing it, which was, you know, kind of that. But um, my rest is extremely consistent now. And I don't do that, you know, stare at the ceiling and try to turn my brain off every single night type thing. Um, that doesn't exist for me anymore. I can, I can turn a switch and I can fall asleep and wake up um, energized. So it was um, Adderall that I was, um, that I was diagnosed on early. We started on a very low prescription, um, low. And then you and I started talking about uh, how much we were on. And I was like, um, but you know, we scaled it up slowly. Um, I will tell you that I do get some of the side effects um, to the max, but uh, I'm a very risk first reward and uh, benefits outweigh the, uh, the downsides, you know, for me. So I'm willing to put up with, you know, some of the, some of the um, side effects that some others aren't. Now I will say the side effects for many are changed. Like my little brother actually isn't taking Adderall anymore. And I actually was going to tell him to jump on the show. Um, but he said he was a couple beers in already. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but my, my brother had a, you know, his, um, his mood swings attached to um, Adderall were extreme highs and extreme lows. Um, you know, later on after even taking Adderall for such a long period of time. So he actually did like a kind of a drug holiday for a long while and then came back to it and slowly now, you know, kind of um, reintroducing it into his um, activities. But uh, for me, that one wasn't a, a big one. I, I will say that, uh, you know, it's one of those things that you have to start asking your friends and people around you and being like, you know, how have I changed or what, are, what things are different? And, um, and, you know, the side effects, you know, you guys can, people always say like, Brian, you're, you're licking your lips or, you know, I, I have cotton mouth, you know, uh, every minute of every day, uh, you know, no matter how much you drink, no matter how much you do. And I have like the world's worst lock jaw. Uh, it, it really feels like there's a screwdriver that's in my jaw on the right on my jaw line um, as two of like the bigger side effects that impact me. But um, even, you know, the fact that I lose my voice on stage a lot, the doctor was like, that probably is a little bit of a link to the Adderall side. To me, yeah. I was like, okay, well, what do I have to drink? I have to drink hot tea more and honey and, and switch to all these remedies. I was willing to do that because I feel that the, the, the benefits have truly um, you know, outweighed, but it's definitely been an interesting piece. Yeah. I mean, for those of you who don't know, I take Adderall as well. And I take a much smaller dose, I think specifically because of kind of the side effects, keeping them to a minimum, but definitely dry mouth was one that was always man, I could not drink enough water. It was just like, gosh, and I, I did, I would lose my voice quite a bit. Um, but I kept it very low as well. I've heard a lot of people that have had, you know, those mood shifts with Adderall, because it's an intense, it, it's, it's basically like, you know, they prescribe it for people with narcolepsy. So it's definitely not a, a chill little drug. No, yeah. And I would um, say, you know, the ramping up of, you know, like I started at five milligrams, like you are at, right. And I, I'm now at, you know, and I'm very transparent because um, that's just kind of how I would way I kind of walk, walk through my life, you know, and I'm at 25 milligrams now. Um, but the ramp up each time when you're jumping those stages, you know, it would be, you know, sleepless nights and not hungry. And then all of a sudden starving and feeling like you're a pothead that was going to eat your entire refrigerator. Um, yeah. you know, like, and, and for me, it was one of those things when you knew it, when you were able to identify it and kind of own the fact like, Hey, I'm changing, I'm going to have to change this. Um, it was, it was, it was something I could tolerate, but I talked to a couple of friends that said like they had never experienced that. So they didn't even really know how to tell people around them or where, where it impacted them. So um, it's definitely one um, for me that is 
you know, an extremely interesting piece because I don't think I, well, I know there's not one size fit all fits all, but I also, I hope when people look at it, I think there was a, there was a question on the side, like, you know, what's the first step to where you're going, you know, for me, I mean, we, I mean, how different of our experiences on how old you, you were eighth grade or how old were you when you got diagnosed? Yeah, I was in eighth grade when I got diagnosed um, and I was put on Adderall and became zombie girl and wanted to sleep all the time. My mother loved it, of course. <laughs> it was like, yep, she's taken care of. Um, but, you know, I, I stopped taking, I refused to take it um, a couple months later. And then that was it for me until I was in my early 20s. And like I told you, I, I thought something was kind of wrong with me. I thought maybe I was having a little bipolar, you know, because I was dealing with depression and anxiety and, and all of those things that you and I were talking about. I mean, for folks who really know ADHD well, and I'm loving all the commentary on the side, I wish I could be in like both places at once. Um, but you know, ADHD is a very complex disorder. There are so many, uh, so many points of it that are stronger in some people than others. Um, we had a great question from Joe Morris here. Uh, has ADHD affected your mood and caused any depression? <laughs> and there he goes. <laughs> Brian, we can't see you. Uh oh, lost him. All right, we'll get that question when he comes back. Don't worry, I'm get sure it's just a minor glitch here. Oh, wait, I got to unlock the seat. You guys are asking a lot of uh, awesome questions, a lot of people sharing your experiences with ADHD. So we thank you for opening up and sharing in the comment section. Um, yeah, thanks, y'all. So appreciate it. I, I wish, like I said, I wish I could be in, in both places at once. I need to turn my ADHD head on, I guess, and, and, you have and Brian, multitask. You have Brian with the <laughs> Anna has it. I have it. So all three of us we reach out to us on Twitter, um, you know, share some of your experiences. <laughs> I saw a squirrel. I got distracted. Sorry. <laughs> Had to jump out for a minute, but you know, I came back. <laughs> Too I was back wondering, in. like, if we were just going to come back wearing something totally different, and it's like an outfit. <laughs> Decided to, uh, you know, uh, redo my sock drawer real quick. Yeah. Um, okay, so when you jumped out, uh, we we're kind of talking about the different aspects of ADHD. So uh, Joe had asked a question: Have you dealt with any depression? Has ADHD caused you any depression? For me, I, you know, I don't feel it has, but I think I am actually, you know, to put that in perspective, I was an internal optimist. I've always been optimist glass. I mean, not even glass half full. I look at things that, you know, how can I fill the glass up, right? I'm, I've always been that side, but with that also comes a lot of failures in my life. I'm, I can tell you like the reason my career is full of change is because I wasn't afraid to dive in and figure it out, but then I wasn't afraid to fail. Um, and I will say one of the things that I've kind of been kind of identifying, even writing this book that I'm writing right now is that, um, I will kind of get, look at something I'm doing now a little bit, um, with, I guess, harder, harder glasses or a harder approach, like being a little bit more harsh on myself. And like, you know, I ended up one night um, after, you know, going out with a couple of friends, going back and deleting two chapters of my book, because I was like, I was on the wrong path. I, I couldn't believe I, what was I doing? And I just took like the most extreme action and like permanently deleted these two chapters of my oh, book. No. Like, <laughs> and like, I, I would say like that, that kind of um, the, a little bit of the, uh, I'd say the pivot with uh, out sometimes thinking the total repercussion would be, I wouldn't say it was depression, but it's something that I kind of um, identify that I didn't really realize that was a, a trait of mine before. But I mean, what about you? What about you? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, um, I don't think that I've, you know, I've known people who are like really deal with depression on a real level. So I don't think that I would ever call myself depressed, you know, like, I'm a woman, man. My hormones are like, you know, and there are just some times where I'm like, I don't feel like dealing with the world right now. Um, and yeah, I mean, that can happen for a couple of days, you know, but I know people who like can't get out of bed because they're depressed. So when someone says like, do you deal with depression? Or like the doctor asked me that I'm like, I really, I, I feel like I can't say yes, you know, but I, I do think that, um, that there are certainly times, and again, I'm a woman, so it's a little bit harder for me to know, is it like my hormones or is it, you know, that I'm ADHD? I think that anxiety plays a much bigger role in, in my ADHD than, than anything. 
Um, but kind of like you were talking about, uh, like just kind of jumping out and making decisions. Like, you know, you're just like, I'm, I was like sitting here trying to think of what that word is. It starts with an I. I can like see it in my impulsive, head, but I can't. Right? Impulsive. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, was, impulsive. Ms. Cheating's ah. mouth, mouth put that in there earlier. Mallory said that. And so she said, I'm like, yep. That, that yes, definitely, that's, exactly. That exactly. Is. And that's such an ADHD thing, you know, like super impulsive, like get home be like, oh, no, can't do that. You know, like, oh, out changing quick, quick, quick. Once you decide something's got to go, it's got to go, you know. And I think that, like you were saying, um, you've been through some hard things. So do you feel like your ADHD has ever taken you to a, a dark place? Or do you think it's ever kind of been responsible for you know, a darker place in your life? Um, I don't think it has in a sense of like true darkness, but I can say um, there was a point where I realized, you know, and it, it does affect everybody differently. And I think that's part of the reason we wanted to have this discussion, not only because, you know, we we're kind of owning it, but, you know, like for me, the taking it really gives me that adrenaline, right? I, I, I can, you know, it's that idea where people are taking it before finals to pull all nighters. Um, and I was playing poker professionally and poker is long hours, long, hard hours at a table, fully concentrating. And I started to push the boundaries of, well, what if I took a, a, a half, you know, a half tablet uh, extra at night? Would I be able to pull, you know, pull an 18 hour session? And I think, so for me, one of those things where I was always pretty, um, Pretty, you know, I I, I kind of believe doctors go to school for a reason, and they're and I don't have a PhD, um, so I take doctors' advice pretty simply, you know, if that's what uh, I guess if I, something about me. But I, for me, I don't think it was a dark place, but it was at one point where I realized, like, hold on a second, like going four days with two days to with like eight hours worth of sleep, I don't care that I'm functionally and I, I'm I'm you know, it's just not somewhere that you know it's gonna put me somewhere. I'm gonna fall asleep driving my car, and I and you know, like, so I quickly kind of. You know, went back. I even went to and told that to the doctor. We even went back, um, you know, five milligrams for you know a, another three months to kind of, hey, okay, let's take this back down a step and see what you did. Um, and I also do. I don't know. I, I don't really like. I said I don't know. Have the back. You know, I do what he, he, they recommend: drug holidays. So every other weekend, I take a weekend off with no Adderall, um, and it does kind of. Um, it makes Monday a very interesting Monday. Um, it makes my weekends <laughs> a little bit harder for a little bit sometimes of the um, motivation. But I think that's also helped me keep things in check a little bit because I can, I mean, I can definitely tell and people around me can tell when there, when there are those, um, you know, ebbs and flows. Yeah. I think you and I were talking a little bit about, you know, the, the manicness of ADHD. Is that something that you, that affects your work? your work habits at all, um, your workflows, kind of how you put things together. Is that something you have to take into account when planning ahead or, or, or planning for the moment? <laughs> or, plan, or planning period. Or, <laughs> planning uh, it all? Yes. Wait a minute, what's that? <laughs> you know, I, you know I, my, my high school yearbook quote was go big or go home. Um, and I like to say that I've learned that, you know, go big with a strategy and then go home and relearn and come back and go big. Right? Like I've, I've almost adapted that. But, um, you know, one of my hardest things is, um, you know, staying focused on one goal, one mission. You know, and I, and, you know, I've, you know, if, if we look around my house right now, above my light switches, there's some pink stinky marks that say, Brian, get this accomplished. You know, and I, and I write on my mirror in my bathroom some goals that I have, um, mainly for my own, like, I'm trying to figure out what works for me. Uh, I'm also one that I don't do anything if it's not 100%. And sometimes if you say yes to everything and you have to do everything 100 um, percent, I've definitely run into spots where I feel like I do nothing because I do everything half assed. Um, and so I, I mean, owning that, I think part of that is really owning it. Like, I mean, the people yeah. that are on my team that I work with and, you know, uh, we were at the Super Bowl. And it's funny when when people start to understand you know, where your skill sets are and where the things are. And you start, you know, I think my strongest, you know, I built a team of 34 people at the government when I worked for the government. And my strongest success was I knew what I didn't know and surrounded myself with people who knew what I did not. And part of that comes into some of those things where, you know, people can give me the swift kick that says, hey, Brian, this is the action you have to take. Um, but I also think that's partially into my transparency element for me, because, I'm not afraid to not only share the failure element of what things I do, but the little bit of the struggles, even in the Snapchat. I mean, the people that have come to me on Snapchat saying they saw a new side of me over the last, you know, six or eight months um, on Snapchat surprised me because I feel like I've, I lived a, a kind of a transparent element of that. But, you know, I think to ultimately understand success, everyone has failures, everyone has 
things that they deal with. And I think some people right now, one of the biggest problems in our generation is I think we all want to, there's a lot of people that want to be thought leaders without having any thought, without actually doing yeah. anything, without actually getting anything done. And I think sometimes we, we approach, we, we look like we're an overnight success. And I, I, I that, that bothers me because I want people to know the background, the struggles, the life, the things I, I, I mean, I, I pull from, I was a president of my fraternity my sophomore year in, in college. I was the youngest. They had to get like a, a bylaw passed in the college to allow a sophomore to become the president of the fraternity. And I learned so many things that, that even those little things that helped me today managing and, and dealing with, you know, different people and different things. So, um, it's an interesting, it's, it's an in- interesting piece for sure, just to kind of understand where you're coming from and how you can best operate to be successful. Well, let's, uh, speaking of success, um, and just for the folks who are wanting to jump in and asking lots of questions, this show will not be over at nine o'clock. We will definitely go off record. But make sure and stick around because we will let you jump in and, and talk with Brian and we'll definitely be discussing more ADHD stuff and answering more questions are on the side. So don't freak out if we haven't gotten to yours. Um, but let's definitely shift kind of this last part of the show. Something that was really important to me when I you know, talked with Brian and I know it was important for Brian too is that we don't just talk about kind of the, the hard parts of having ADHD, but both of us, I think, feel that this makes us unique you know, the way our minds work is unique. The, the things that we do are unique because of, of who we are. And um, so I, I wanna spend some time kind of really talking a little bit about how this has been a pro. And, and John Pratt asked a great question just to kind of segue in, uh, has ADHD been a strength in your life? Well, you know, um, without question, yes. I mean, I, I look at it as, um, my root of my success has so much to do with the idea that I don't have to be the master of something. I don't have to be the very best at it, but I will always give 100% and I will always be open to learning. And I think the thing with ADHD is we dive into so many things that, you know, I like to say that I, you know, my most success I've ever had in my entire life was nine years with the Department of Defense and cybersecurity. And I never took a class in cybersecurity ever. Um, but I was a product of YouTube University. I realized that I could learn stuff on the weekends. I could teach it to the military during the week, which still scares me a little bit. Um, but then I, but, you know, I could almost, you know, I, I, I would always say I love to hire for the skill set that you have the ability to roll with the punches. And I think with yeah. ADHD, the p- rolling with the punches is just really how we live our lives. And I think that aspect also wanted me to like, you know, like not only do I feel like we should talk about these kind of things, but when, when we start talking about it, like I said, that, that simple Snapchat that I made that said, you know, like I'm like at the doctor's office, you know, and I, you know, and I'm, cause I'm transparent. I don't even, you know, and someone said, what, what are you there for? And I'm like, oh, I just snapped back and literally said here to get my, you know, ADHD. I'm not sure if you guys have noticed, but I haven't had it for the last two days. I've been struggling on a couple of things. I'm excited to get it back in. And then when the influx of people that came and said, thank you. And I was like, wait a second. Like if I knew more people are struggling and I'll use a really weird story in this, it comes to tattoos. And I was presenting at the joint chiefs of staff in the Pentagon. And I, I was talking to them about understanding change and millennials and this idea of, you know, embracing your people who, for who they are. And they wanted me to wear a tie and a jacket. And I kept telling them, no, thank you. I'm not going to present there on change and being yourself. And you're going to be forced me to look like someone that I'm not. And they finally gave in. And I had a very nice general come up to me after my presentation, tell me it was one of the best presentations he ever heard. And he was so excited. And millennials are, you know, this is the type of millennial I absolutely love. And you're exactly leading the charge. I'm so proud of you. He like, he's like, you know, the only real problem we have with the millennial generation are those idiots with tattoos. And I immediately went, oh, tattoos, you mean tattoos. And his face, I mean, dropped whenever I showed that I had tattoos. Not only did I have them, I was proud of them. Um, And it it like, it really bothered me. It was like a jab. It was one of those things I said, wow, like really, we're going to, we're going to put a label on someone. We're going to judge someone. You were just building me up and saying how amazing I am. And the fact that I have something that you were kind of, um, and so long story short is this ended up being a meerkat where I meerkatted my next tattoo for three and a half hours. And I sent him the link and said, not only am I not ashamed of it, but I believe that I like to work with people who are proud of who they are. And I kind of look at that as in this ADHD thing. The reason I was so you know willing to talk about it, you know, and I think you and I not only related, but we kind of, we, we have to tell a little bit of the story of, you know, I'm a boy, you're a girl. 
<laughs> element of it because that was that was actually awesome because it was like this not only we come from like different backgrounds but you know your yoga and eating healthy i'm a, you know a dad of three that is running around like a madman that's drinking monster energy i'm a man that got diagnosed skills. yeah they, I, you know it's but you know, for me for me i think this is the this is the idea that i don't think leadership someone is a leader because of their title and i don't yeah. think because of someone struggles or because of what they've dealt with in their life makes them any less um, able to succeed. Oftentimes it probably is the reason they succeed. Um, I think that's why the sharing this story, I mean, it has been a strength. I mean, I can read books. I've read more, I read more books before I turned 32 from the year I was 31 to 32. than I read in my first 31 years of my life. Um, and two of those books in that year, um, changed my career path as a whole. I read, um, you know, I read Crush It from Gary Vaynerchuk. And then I read, I led into that um, reading, you know, uh, Starts With Why from Simon Sinek that led into Jay Bear's book, Utility and Jab, 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 Right Hook from Gary V. And all of those four books really dialed me into understanding a world that I wasn't very familiar in. But I don't know if I am as successful today in the social space, content marketing, even live streaming space, if it wasn't for being diagnosed, because I know for a fact, I would have never read those books. And the fact that, that those books have had I mean, that much of an impact on me, to me, that's been a, you know, a, a massive strength in, in kind of my career success for sure. Nice. So I, I know for me, it was, it was huge to have a, a name kind of attached to what it was that I was dealing with in order for me to kind of you know, find a solution and start moving forward. And I think that you just said that yourself as well, that once you are actually diagnosed, then things like really started changing for you and you were able to harness this incredible, you know, gift, I think. I mean, ADHD for me personally has, you know, I grew up in a family restaurant. And so I was like trying to get, you know, wait, that waitressing money at like age 10. And I could multitask like nobody's business, you know? I was a little 10 year old getting hyped up in the midst of, you know, the, the nightly rush um, while everyone else was freaking out. I've always been able to do those sorts of things that I think a lot of people can't. Um, but I think that like being able to understand what it is that you're dealing with is so crucial to being able to deal with it and to harness it, you know? Like we talked about earlier a little bit about that impulsivity that that can be not so good but then at the same time it can be amazing because when we're ready to do something we're not like hmm well let me like you know oh, and here, here's the day. Thing. it's like boosh you the know? reason my the reason my career is where it's at today is for one impulse decision I made at a help desk sitting in a help desk working for the Department of Defense um, in 2005 2004 and I raised my hand faster than anyone else and the reason that that had such an impact is the manager came in and said, who here can go to Korea on Monday and teach this class? And my hand was first up. I was impulsive. And he said, do you have a passport? I said, no. He's like, have you traveled to Korea? I said, no. He's like, do you think you know enough about the product that you could actually teach it? I said, no, but I have a couple of days to learn it. And he said, all right, I'm gonna get you a same day passport. I'm gonna fly you to Korea. It was my first time not going to the Caribbean you know, on a cruise ship, but it was leaving the country. Um, I flew to Seoul, Korea. I taught a class that I read the book. You know, I, I studied it that night. I taught the class on the flight home. They, the, I landed and they said, Brian, we just want to let you know, you've been promoted to that job. That was four levels up promotion. I, w I went from entry level help desk to a training lead that I, over five years, I grew that one position that was a one person gig into a 32 person role that taught four training classes a, uh, a week. I mean, we taught 160 classes a year because of that one impulsive decision that whenever he, and I can tell you, I can hear to this day when he walks in that, that help desk, there was no business. Anybody else in their right mind would say, go to Korea, Teach, I'd only worked there for six months that everyone else there was senior over me. And it was that impulse. And there's a little bit of that confidence and the ability that I'm, I'm not afraid to say that I don't know it. And I'm not afraid to say I'm going to learn it. But yeah, I didn't mean to jump you off on that. But I was like, as soon as you said, it, I'm like, I mean, that, that impulse, it, it can be, it can cause us some issues, but it also can have some major awesome you know, impacts and, and effects on us as well. No, I mean, the thing is like, I'm 100% right there with you. There've been a couple of places in my life where if I hadn't made that quick decision and or jumped in really quickly. And, you know, I, I, 
when I was younger, I used to think back to at least two of those decisions that would just like start, you know, make my heart beat because it was like my life would have been so different if I had not done that, you know, and I'm sure that you can kind of understand that as well. It's like if I hadn't jumped up and grabbed, you know, this job, what would have happened? I mean, big um, <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and start wrapping down the show again, folks at nine o'clock, we're going to open up the seat. We're going to start letting people jump in. Um, Brian now like you're up for a shorty award and let's show them some love folks and some encouragement online. Um, where's the best place for people to contact you and get a hold of you? Well, you know, I coach personal branding and I believe consistency, um, you know, other than standing out from the crowd by being yourself, being consistent is the next best way to being found. So I am iSocial fans everywhere and anywhere you can imagine from Snapchat to Periscope, uh, iSocialFans.com um, from a website perspective. Uh, in that in that mode of knowing what you know and know you don't know, um, I'd say email is probably the third option of getting a hold of me. Uh, tweet me. Uh, we can move that <laughs> to a, a DM or even a snap. There's a couple of cli- uh, there's actually two speaking clients now that have, have taken to snapping me uh, on a regular basis uh, for some engagement. A 10 second video for me is like those pop out like wide wildfire, but 140 word uh email sometimes is, is something I overthink. But uh, yeah, I social fans everywhere. You know, um, I love this. I, I love, you know, part of the reason I love Blab is it's empowered us all to really not only have our own story, but tell people's stories. And the fact now that we can come on, you know, Anna, you and I have not met face to face yet. We have, we were, we were connected in that weird world of like just Twitter chats and Twitter and like a mutual association agency life. Um, you know, and then Snapchat kind of took a personal level of it. We were able to share, you know, and engage on a, on a much more regular basis. But, you know, now we're able to not only share our struggles, but we're able to tell the story. And hopefully, you know, for me, um, I always like to say, what does success look like? And everything you're doing, if you can define what success looks like, um, failure is not scary because you'll know you never never settle until you get that success. And for me, success on this was knowing that nobody is perfect, that we all have a story to tell and we can all own that. And you can not only find people that have similar stories, but similar people that will rally behind you. So thank you, Anna, for taking the, the bull by the horns. Because if, you know, both of us having ADHD to get the skill, <laughs> get off the road and actually get it, you know, implemented does take a little bit of, uh, of extra work. And um, I'm, I'm just glad to be a part of it. And, and um, you know, I, I'm excited to even see where this conversation leads to in the future. And you know, I, I truly am. Uh, and I, the, the Shorty Award's a whole nother thing. I, I, that blew me away. And uh, Ryan Bell is in, in, in here as well. And he's a partner of mine at uh, Backlamp. And he's also nominated. Um, and it's one of those things being recognized in an industry that hasn't, isn't even a year old uh, gives us that ha- are impulsive, that suffer from fear of missing out, the confidence that you can get recognized early on. So, um, no, thanks so much for having me. No, no, no. Thank you. Um... Okay, folks, just to let you know, make sure that you subscribe to next week's show. We will be interviewing Miss Kara Parrish again. Uh, This time she'll actually make it. Her boyfriend's not going to carry her off to a safari. Um, But we'll be talking about changing the world one business at a time. Kara is a ridiculous little powerhouse. um, And she makes sure that everyone she works with is actually working on a program to better the world in in that industry. So make sure that you jump in, um, join us on that one. Brian, I so appreciate you coming on, taking the time. Like, I wish we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours because I feel like there is so much to discuss, but I'm happy that we got to start this conversation. And I think that it's definitely going to continue far outside of Blab um, and I'm just, you know, thankful in the the hope that we can share because, you know, even KP, who hasn't really said a word, <laughs> also has ADHD, which uh, we'll talk about more after nine, but, uh, you know, and all of us are we're doing well. So um, I think, uh, you know, I think this is a great thing. And, and just thanks so much, Brian. Everybody yoga hands. <laughs> All right. And thank you so much to our incredible, incredible, incredible audience, to everyone who has taken the time to join us and hang out with us and share your stories. Folks, you're incredible. Again, I wish I could have been in two places at once. I'll definitely be reading back through this and 
look for me to connect with you on Twitter. If I don't, please connect with me and say hi. Um, but just thank you so much for joining us tonight on Behind the Brand. And join us next week, 8 p.m. Eastern, same place, same time. <laughs>